Chapter 16, Liberty Day on Shore. The next day being Sunday, after washing and clearing decks and getting breakfast, the mate came forward with leave for one watch to go ashore on Liberty. We drew lots and it fell to the larboard, which I was in. Instantly, all was preparation. Buckets of fresh water, which we were allowed in port, and soap were put in use. Go ashore jackets and trousers got out and brushed. Pumps, neckerchiefs, and hats overhauled. One lending to another so that among the whole, each one got a good fit out. A boat was called to pull the, quote, liberty men, end of quote, ashore, and we sat down in the stern sheets, quote, as big as pay passengers, end of quote, and jumping ashore, set out on our walk for the town, which was nearly three miles off. It is a pity that some other arrangement is not made in merchant vessels with regard to the Liberty Day. When in port, the crews are kept at work all the week, and the only day they are allowed for rest or pleasure is the Sabbath, and unless they go ashore on that day, they cannot go at all. I have heard of a religious captain who gave his crew liberty on Saturdays after 12 o'clock. This would be a good plan if shipmasters would bring themselves to give their crews so much time. For young sailors especially, many of whom have been brought up with a regard for the scaredness of the day, excuse me, with a regard for the sacredness of the day, this strong temptation to break it is exceedingly injurious. As it is, it can hardly be expected that a crew on a long and hard voyage will refuse a few hours of freedom from toil and the restraints of a vessel and an opportunity to tread the ground and see the sights of society and humanity, because it is on a Sunday. It is too much like escaping from prison or being drawn out of a pit on the Sabbath day. I shall never forget the delightful sensation of being in the open air with the birds singing around me and escaped from the confinement, labor, and strict rule of a vessel, of being once more in my life, though only for a day, my own master. A sailor's liberty is but for a day, yet while it lasts, it is perfect. He is under no one's eye and can do whatever and go wherever he pleases. This day, for the first time, I may truly say in my whole life, I felt the meaning of a term which I had often heard, the sweets of liberty. My friend S. was with me, and turning our backs upon the vessels, we walked slowly along, talking of the pleasure of being our own masters, of the times past and when we were free in the midst of friends in America, and of the prospect of our return and planning where we would go and what we would do when we reached home. It was wonderful how the prospect brightened and how short and tolerable the voyage, voyage appeared when viewed in this new light. Things looked differently from what they did when we talked them over in the little dark forecastle the night after the flogging at San Pedro. It is not the least of the advantages of allowing sailors occasionally a day of liberty that it gives them a spring and makes them feel cheerful and independent and leaves them insensibly to look on the bright side of everything for some time after. S and myself determined to keep as much together as possible, though we knew that it would not do to cut our shipmates. For knowing our birth and education, they were a little suspicious that we would try to put on on that we would try to put on the gentlemen when we got ashore and would be ashamed of their company. And this won't do with Jack. When the voyage is at an end, you may do as you please, but so long as you belong to the same vessel, you must be a shipmate to him on shore, or he will not be a shipmate to you on board. Being forewarned of this before I went to sea, I took no, quote, long togs, end of quote, with me, and being dressed like the rest, in white duck trousers, blue jacket, and straw hat, which would prevent my going in better company, and showing no disposition to avoid them, I set all suspicion at rest. Our crew fell in with some who belonged to the other vessels and, sailor-like, steered for the first grog shop. This was a small mud building of only one room in which were liquors, dry and wet, dry and West India goods, shoes, bread, fruits, and everything which is vendable in California. It was kept by a Yankee, a one-eyed man who belonged formerly to Fall River, came out to the Pacific in a whale ship, left her at the Sandwich Islands, and came to California and set up a, quote, pulperia, end of quote. S and I followed in our shipmates' wake, knowing that to refuse to drink with them would be the highest affront, but determining to slip away at the first opportunity. It is the universal custom with sailors for each one, in his turn, to treat the whole, calling for a glass all round and obliging everyone who was present, even the keeper of the shop, to take a glass with him. When we first came in, there was some dispute between our crew and the others whether the newcomers or the old California rangers should treat first. But it being settled in favor of the latter, each of the crews of the other vessels treated all round in their turn, 
and as there were a good many present, including some loafers who had dropped in, knowing what was going on to take advantage of Jack's hospitality. And the liquor was a real, 12 and a half cents, a glass that made somewhat of a hole in their lockers. It was now our ship's turn, and S and I, anxious to get away, stepped up to call for glasses, but we soon found that we must go in order. The oldest first, for the old sailors did not choose to be preceded by a couple of youngsters, and bon gray and mal gray, we had to wait our turn, with the twofold apprehension of being too late for our horses and of getting corned. For drink you must every time, and if you drink with one and not with another, it is always taken as an insult. Having at length gone through our turns and acquitted ourselves of all obligations, we slipped out and went about among the houses, endeavoring to get horses for the day, so that we might ride round and see the country. At first we had but little success, all that we could get of the lazy fellow fellows in reply to our questions being the eternal drawling, quien sabe, who knows, which is an answer to all questions. <clears throat> After several efforts, we at length fell in with a little Sandwich Island boy who belonged to Captain Wilson of the Ayacucho and was well acquainted in the place. And he, knowing where to go, soon procured us two horses, ready saddled and bridled, each with a lasso coiled over the pommel. These we were to have all day with the privilege of riding them down to the beach at night for a dollar which we had to pay in advance. Horses are the cheapest thing in California, the very best not being worth more than ten dollars apiece, and very good ones being often sold for three and four. In taking a day's ride, you pay for the use of the saddle and for the labor and trouble of catching the horses. If you bring the saddle back safe, they care but little what becomes of the horse. Mounted on our horses, which were spirited beasts, and which, by the way, in this country are always steered by pressing the contrary rein against the neck and not by pulling on the bit, we started off on a fine run over the country. The first place we went was to the old ruinous Presidio, which stands on a rising ground near the village which it overlooks. It is built in the form of an open square like all the other presidios and was in a most ruinous state with the exception of one side in which the commandant lived with his family. There were only two guns, one of which was spiked and the other had no carriage. Twelve half-clothed and half-starved looking fellows composed the garrison and they, it was said, had not a musket apiece. The small settlement lay directly below the fort composed of, of about 40 dark brown looking huts or houses and two larger ones plastered which belonged to two of the gente de raison. This town is not more than a half as large as Monterey or Santa Barbara and has little or no business. From the Presidio, we rode off in the direction of the mission, which we were told was three miles distant. The country was rather sandy and there was nothing for miles which could be called a tree, but the grass grew green and rank and there were many brushes and thickets and the soil is said to be good. After a pleasant ride of a couple of miles, we saw the white walls of the mission and fording a small river we came directly before it. The mission is built of mud, or rather of the unburnt bricks of the country and plastered. There was something decidedly striking in its appearance. A number of irregular buildings connected with one another and disposed in the form of a hollow square, with a church at one end rising above the rest, with a tower containing five belfries, in each of which hung a large bell, and with immense rusty iron crosses at the tops. Just outside of the buildings and under the walls stood twenty or thirty small huts, built of straw and of the branches of trees grouped together. In which a few Indians lived under the protection and in the service of the mission. Entering a gateway, we drove into the open square in which the stillness of death reigned. On one side was the church, on another a range of high buildings with grated windows, the third was a range of smaller buildings or offices, and the fourth seemed to be little more than a high connecting wall. Not a living creature could we see. We rode twice round the square in the hope of walking up, in the hope of waking up someone, and in one circuit saw a tall monk with shaven head, sandals, and the dress of the Grey Friars pass rapidly through a galley, through a gallery but he disappeared without noticing us. After two circuits, we stopped our horses and saw at last a man show himself in front of one of the small buildings. We rode up to him and found him dressed in the common dress of the country with a silver chain round his neck, supporting a large bunch of keys. From this, we took him to be the steward of the mission and addressing him as Mayor Domo, received a low bow and an invitation to walk into his room.
Making our horses fast, we went in. It was a plain room containing a table, three or four chairs, a small picture or two of some saint or miracle or martyrdom and a few dishes and glasses. Hey, algunas cosas de comer, said I. Si, sí, senor, said he. Que gusta usted, mentioning frijoles, which I knew they must have if they had nothing else, and beef and bread and a hint for wine. If they had any, he went off to another building across the court and returned in a few moments with a couple of Indian boys bearing dishes and a decanter of wine. The dishes contained baked meats, frijoles, stewed with peppers and onions, boiled eggs and California flour baked into a kind of macaroni. These, together with the wine, made the most sumptuous meal we had eaten since we left Boston, and compared with the fare we had lived upon for seven months, it was a real banquet. After dispatching our meal, we took out some money and asked him how much we were to pay. He shook his head and crossed himself, saying that it was charity, that the Lord gave it to us, knowing the amount of this to be that he did not sell it, but was willing to receive a present. We gave him ten or twelve reals, which he pocketed with admirable nonchalance, saying, Dios se lo pague. Taking leave of him, we rode out to the Indians' huts. The little children were running about among the huts, stark naked, and the men were not much better. But the women had generally coarse gowns of a sort of tow cloth. The men are employed most of the time in tending the cattle of the mission and in working in the garden, which is a very large one, including several acres, and filled, it is said, with the best fruits of the climate. The language of these people, which is spoken by all the Indians of California, is the most British, brutish, the most brutish and inhuman language without any exception that I have ever heard or that could well be conceived of. It is complete slabber. The words fall off of the ends of their tongues and a continual slabbering sound is made in the cheeks, outside of the teeth. It cannot have been the language of Montezuma and the independent Mexicans. Here among the huts we saw the oldest man that I had ever seen and indeed I never supposed that a person could retain life and exhibit such marks of age. He was sitting out in the sun, leaning against the side of a hut, and his legs and arms, which were bare, were of dark red color. The skin withered and shrunk up like burnt leather, and the limbs not larger round than those of a boy of five years. He had a very, he had a few gray hairs which were tied together at the back of his head, and he was so feeble that when we came up to him, he raised his hands slowly to his face, and taking hold of his lids with his fingers, lifted them up to look at us, and being satisfied, let them drop again. All command over the lids seemed to have gone. I asked his age, but could get no answer but Queen Sebe, and they probably did not know the age. <laughs> Leaving the mission, we returned to village, going nearly all the way on a full run. The California horses have no medium gait, which is pleasant, between walking and running, for as there are no streets and parades, they have no need of the genteel trot, and no streets and parades, excuse me, and their riders usually keep them at the top of their speed until they are tired, and then let them rest themselves by walking. The fine air of the afternoon, the rapid rate of the animals who seemed almost to fly over the ground, and the excitement and novelty of the motion to us, who had been so long confined on shipboard, were exhilarating beyond expression, and we felt willing to ride all day long. Coming into the village, we found things looking very lively. The Indians, who always have a holly day on Sunday, were engaged at playing a kind of running game of ball on a level piece of ground near the houses. The old ones sat down in a ring looking on while the young ones, men, boys, and girls were chasing the ball and throwing it with all their might. Some of the girls ran like greyhounds. At every accident or remarkable feat, the old people set up a deafening screaming and clapping of hands. Several blue jackets were reeling about among the houses which showed that the pulperias had been well patronized. One or two of the sailors had got on horseback, but being rather indifferent horsemen and the Spaniards having given them vicious horses, they were soon thrown much to the amusement of the people. A half dozen Sandwich Islanders from the hide houses and the two brigs, who were bold riders, were dashing about on the full gallop, hallooing and laughing like so many wild men. It was now nearly sundown, and S and myself went into a house and sat quietly down to rest ourselves before going to the beach, going down to the beach. Several people were soon collected to see Los Ingles Marineros, and one of them, a young woman, took a great fancy to my pocket handkerchief, which was a large silk one that I had before going to see, and a handsomer one than they had been in the habit of seeing. Of course, I gave it to her, which brought us into high favor, and we had a present of some pears and other fruits, which we took down to the beach with us. 
When we came to leave the house, we found that our horses, which we left tied at the door, were both gone. We had paid for them to ride down to the beach, but they were not to be found. We went to the man of whom we hired them, but he only shrugged his shoulders, and to our question, where are the horses, only answered, Quien sabe? But as he was very easy and made no inquiries for the saddles, we saw that he knew very well where they were. After a little trouble, determined not to walk down a distance of three miles, we procured two, at four reals apiece, with an Indian boy to run on behind and bring them back, determined to have, quote, the go, end of quote, out of the horses. For our trouble, we went down at full speed and were on the beach in 15 minutes. Wishing to make our liberty, la liberty last as long as possible, we rode up and down among the hide houses, amusing ourselves with seeing the men as they came down. It was now dusk. Some on horseback and others on foot. The Sandwich Islanders rode down and were in, quote, high snuff, end of quote. We inquired for our shipmates and were told that two of them had started on horseback and had been thrown or had fallen off and were seen heading for the beach, but steering pretty wild and by the looks of things would not be down much before midnight. The Indian boys having arrived, we gave them our horses and having seen them safely off, hailed for a boat and went aboard. Thus ended our first liberty day on shore. We were well tired, but had had a good time and were more willing to go back to our old duties. About midnight, we were waked up by our two watchmates who had come aboard in high dispute. It seems they had started to come down on the same horse, doubled backed, double backed, and each was accusing the other of being the cause of his fall. They soon, however, turned in and fell asleep and probably forgot all about it, for the next morning the dispute was not renewed. <laughs>